Hi everyone, welcome to No Nonsense Whiskey Live. This is uh, a bit of an odd one for me because I'm doing it on a Wednesday, but uh, never mind. Today we are actually with Whiskey Wednesday, and as I understand, we're going to be kind of replacing his uh, his um, standard upload because he uh, he might have just missed it today. But we'll talk about why in a bit. He's a a bit of a tired chap, bless him. So let's go straight into it and introduce Phil from Whiskey Wednesday. Hello everyone. You might know me from some very luxuriously edited videos on YouTube, none of which is my responsibility. Um, but here I am. I, as been mentioned, I sort of forgot to upload a video today due to a combination of jet lag and numerous other things. But let me tell you a bit about me. What do we do? We review videos every Wednesday, uh, hence the name. We like alliteration, except today. And then we like to keep things as interesting and as different as possible. Um, I was also as short as possible too, so very kind of quick, to-the-point reviews, uh, nothing too in-depth, although if you would have watched the channel when I first took over, I did get a little bit ranty, in a good way, and things went on for quite a bit, it was like 12, sometimes 15-minute videos. Uh, but now we keep it short and snappy, we like to do things in a very, uh, what do we say? We say informative, but informal manner, so it looks very pretty and very nice, but you know, it's to the point, this, 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 and this, try it, taste it, smell it, see what you think. And yeah, we just kind of roll on from there. And luckily, Vin was very nice uh, to ask me to do one of these things. And as I was telling him before, this is only the second one of these I've ever done. My first one was with the Scotch Test Dummies. It was like last July, because I remember doing it and I had a hangover from a Pappy Van Winkle tasting, which is quite a nice thing to have. You know, it's not, not the worst thing in the world. And uh, yeah, I remember like they said, oh, you know, we're going to go live at half four. And I was like dying in my bedroom but still managed to get down the Lagavulin 16s and uh, a couple of other fun things that they had for me. But yeah, I'm really happy to be here. This is really cool. It's a bit different. And we've got some very nice whiskies to talk you guys through today. A bit of a theme. Uh, but I'll hand back to Vin so we can kind of walk through a few things. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, if you caught the title, um, it's actually we, we had a bit of um, to and fro in before we, when we agreed on the date. We didn't really know what thing <clears> to do. I think we actually hit on uh, Phil's idea, which was to do uh, kind of summertime whiskies. You know, uh, as we said in the pre-show, the um, we've been kind of lucky in the UK. Um, I've been getting a lot of sunshine down in the Midlands. Uh, you're not too far away from me in Manchester, are you? No, not at all. So it's been okay for summer. Uh, so now it's getting a time when I'm putting the heavier stuff away and I'm bringing out the lighter stuff. But Phil was very kind enough to send me uh, four samples, which we'll probably try and get through fairly rapidly today. But I'll, I'll bring them out sort of one at a time now, and then we'll go through them each one at a time, but um, in my glass, and I think in yours as well. Yeah, rocking the same yeah. one right now. Yeah, that's it. The Tullamore Dew 14-year-old. Irish. Yeah. This is um, this was a whiskey that I got made aware of a while ago, and only managed to actually buy it fully this year. So Master of Malt had it, and it kept going in a stock, out of stock, in a stock, out of stock. But a very important thing, which someone has asked me to say today, uh, this whiskey was actually recommended to me by Mr. Joe Ellis, who used to run this channel um, he handed it over to me nearly two years ago now which is actually kind of frightening when I think about it and he messaged me one day and just said you need to try this bottle it is I think as of two years ago it would have been his whiskey of the year if he was still in charge of the channel and still running things um, he also wants you all to know that he misses doing this very dearly and would love to have taken part tonight but sadly he's a very very busy man um, so if Joe tells me something's good I'm like well it's Joe so he must know what he's talking about because he's Joe Ellis. So I bought one this year, actually during Paddy's Day, because the company I work for now stock it. And I thought, I'll take advantage, get a hold of one, cracked it open on the day. And this is actually my second bottle within, what, three months, nearly four months? Because uh, I do believe it's that good. And quite unusually for an Irish whiskey, it is a single malt whiskey. So 100% malted barley. Uh, there's no pot still style of malted and unmalted. And it is still triple distilled in a classic Irish fashion. It's 41.3% and uses Port Madeira, uh, Masala. Oh, no, I've got that wrong. Bourbon, yeah, ex bourbon, ex sherry, ex port, and ex Madeira barrels. So, really fruity style. Irish whiskey, classically very light, very approachable. I think I did review this years ago when it was still like a single camera setup in my old flat. Uh, but it's from a tiny sample bottle. But now we have the full thing. And I get to experience it with another member of this amazing little community that we all kind of work in on YouTube. Um, and it's a great little whiskey. And to find Irish single malt now, 
I think, you know, not many people really do it anymore. So, you know, tell them what you were moving forward. There's an 18 year old version of this too, which I've not tried, but would love to. And apologies for the brightness there. I've just turned my laptop on, but you know, Teeling, you know, might have one in the future and Connemara technically is a, is a, excuse me, a single mod, but it's a bit peaty. So it's quite unusual in the Irish style. But, um, after doing a Paddy's Day tasting, and this went down a storm, uh, I was amazed by how many people knew so little about Irish whiskey, which is quite unusual because it's been the biggest growing spirit on the planet since 1990. You know, it's, had, it's hit its second resurgence. There are something silly like 20 new distilleries opening in the next decade in Ireland. So they will be the country to keep an eye on in the next couple of years. I truly believe that. Uh, and I think this whiskey is kind of leading the way a little bit between blends, grains, pot stills, and the single malt styles you know these guys literally have it all and it's a very open market and as soon as you start talking about jameson's to someone you can talk about Bushmills, and you can talk about middleton and go to redbreast and tullamore and connemara um i think it's a very open world style and it's not as dividing the scottish whiskey because i remember the first time i tried lafroig when i was like 18 and just kind of thought why why would you make or want something to taste like this and now I love Lafroig. It's the whiskey I own the most of in terms of bottles. Um, but yeah, I think Irish whiskey is the perfect Kickstarter if you don't want the spiciness of bourbon as well as the sweetness, if you don't want the possible smokiness or peatiness of Scottish whiskey. Uh, this is an ideal starting point, and it still has those two magical words of single malt written on the front of it, which, as we all know, is people who've worked in retail or just overheard conversations at bars. If it doesn't say single malt, a lot of people aren't interested. Um Whereas Tullamore Dew has now moved forward from that old school blended style, not actually having their own distillery for a number of years, and has now been taken over by William Grants. And they're really pushing forward with this new style and new approach. And, you know, pardon the pun relating to the nose and the taste, but a very fresh, interesting, and dynamic style of Irish whiskey. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, Irish whiskey is a great choice because I, I really love the, the kind of most of them are triple distilled. Uh, and obviously, there's mm -hmm. some Scotch that do it as well. And it's just, such a like the theory behind it. I'm not sure if it's actually science or theory, but it's meant to produce a lighter whiskey, isn't it? But um, in theory, I mean, anyone is more than welcome to correct me with this because I'm not a biochemist or a master distiller or anything. But essentially, the more you distill something, the closer it becomes to water, but the concentration of alcohol you'll have will be higher. So you know, instead of running it off the still at 68 percent, it's more likely to be 70 plus. And obviously, there's a point when producing whiskey where if you produce it to a certain alcoholic percentage it will cease to have any sort of flavor profile which is when you use column stills you can get such high abv because there's very little flavor whereas with pot stills a higher abv you'll still get flavor but there'll be a point where it's like it's verging on the point of being somewhat of a neutral grain style <clears throat> and with irish whiskey the triple distillation thing i've tried to do research on it so much and find a reason as to why it's triple distilled and all i can figure out was there was a certain law that got passed a couple of years, well, a couple of years back, a couple of hundred years ago, where Ireland was taxed on, I think it was the size of their stills. So they were producing such a large amount and it probably wasn't very good because they were just churning it out for the sake of churning it out, much like the Scottish were in the 1800s. And when these laws finally got a little bit kind of more relaxed, it was like, oh, we've got this huge amount of whiskey. It's not very good. So what if we distill it again and again and just kind of get a more, a more refined product? Again, my knowledge of history in that section isn't great. So if anyone does know, do correct me. Um, my internet connection has just dropped through the roof. So I'm assuming my housemate is doing something intense on his very expensive lap, uh, PC upstairs. Um, but I will try and get the comments section up so I can reply to a few things myself. That's all right. You're still coming through loud and clear. But um, talking oh, about good, the good. section, I think I'll uh, just say hello to the people that have been dropping in. Yeah, um, I have no idea who's here and who isn't. <laughs> Uh, Kilted Moose and Tom R, they were in from the start. Uh, Dwayne Large, hello, mate. Um, he's one of my uh, Patreon subscribers. Thank you very much. Oh, Kilted cool. Moose is back to years as well. Uh, Eric Way is in. If, if you caught his trip, he's in uh, Edinburgh at the moment doing an amazing trip. He's, he's, uh, hello, he's Eric. Yeah, he's everybody watching as well. The haggis um, looked lovely. Yeah, I know, it did, didn't it? Uh, we've got Whiskey and a Beard in. Hello, go oh, have hi, as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Welsh Toro. Um, still local to me. I still need to meet up with this guy, but it, it just, I just don't seem to find myself over in Birmingham much these days. No, we, I know Welsh very well. He's a, an avid commenter and a man of very strong and valid and valued opinion as well on a, our comment yeah. section. If uh, if Welsh tells me I'm wrong, I know I'm wrong. That's all I'll say. Same. About that. Yeah, same. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Uh, obviously, Aquavite's in. Thank you, buddy, for coming in. Stephen Aldridge is in as well. Uh, Mark Broder, hello, buddy, coming in. Um, Jason Coates is in as well. Oh, and Whiskey Throw. I think I didn't mention you before, but yeah, thanks okay. everyone for coming in. Um, there's a couple yeah, of people guys. saying that they love uh, your videos. Oh, thank you very much. So that means quite a lot. I will say, I am just the face. Um, <laughs> all of the amazing things that you see behind the scenes are thanks to. Uh, two but normally three wonderful men one is called ed he is our cameraman and uses the most amazing camera equipment that i have no idea how much it costs but probably more than the house i'm sat in um sean who's like our director and uh, editor and pete who does our sound when he's not working for itv or bbc or all this kind of thing so just quite coincidental i happen to know someone who's got all this amazing equipment and when the idea of this came around, they got in touch with me and said, you know, you're filming it in your flat, that's kind of cool. And it's very kind of, you know, rudimentary, it's to the ground. But what about, you know, if we did this and if we did that? And I was like, I'm down for it. Um, you know, I, I pay a certain amount of money to get it done, but the quality at the end of it is unreal. And in the last two months, we've been filming in 4K, which doesn't come across that well on YouTube at the minute. Um, but hopefully when things get upgraded a little bit, the, um, those kind of like out of focus zoom in shots that Ed does of the bottles and the panning down and all that kind of thing, it really... Whisk is kind of a sexy thing anyway, but when you have that, when the bar was sat in the whiskey jar, like the backdrop is beautiful. Um, I love the guys in there, like Max, Mike, and Tatiana. They really help us out when we're rushing to film four videos in one go and they let us in in the morning so we can like get it done and get out of their hair. Um, but yeah, the videos look amazing. I just talk. Um, so all of the beautiful stuff you see in the light jazz in the background, um, that is all totally out of my hands. But uh, I, just, I just turn up, I drink. They drink with me, and luckily the production stays consistent, which is quite nice. Absolutely. I was going to say to you as well, um, obviously uh, I know the challenges of starting a YouTube channel and getting recognised. Yes. But yeah. you're probably the only whiskey tuber that I know of that um, took on an already established uh, channel. And I, 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 mm. I was a fan of Joe's. Uh, me too. I yeah. of yours. But uh, I know, especially at the start, when um, like uh, you were you were just getting used to it, same as I was when I started. Yep. But um, there was definitely some uh, kind of mid-level negativity uh, that you had to kind of work through, I guess, when because uh, people don't like change so much, do they? No, no. Um, whiskey, whiskey drinkers are some of the strangest people you'll ever meet. Wonderful, but strange because some people are very open to new things and very diverse, and some of them are. A bit more old school, and I'll never condemn anyone for that. You know, it's, it's just the way you are. It's, it's fine. But it's quite funny to watch it now. And I do actually quite like this question because I've never had to answer this question before, and it's something I've thought about a lot. So I was a fan of Joe. Uh, I used to work with Joe on, like, a professional level. And then he moved back to Birmingham from Manchester. And one day he just messaged me and said, look, I don't think I can keep up with this anymore. My work's keeping me really busy. Um, is there any chance you'd, like, you'd be interested? And I went, sure, no problem. Um, not even prepared for the amount of work that it entailed in any way. Because for people who've ever edited video and sound and filmed things, which I hadn't done since college, and I'm 20, I turned 26 the other day. So, you know, that was eight years ago since I'd done, did anything with editing or sound. Um, and I was kind of like, cool. So I, I, I borrowed a friend's camera, and it's quite funny now, and I've, I'll never take the video down. But if you watch the first ever review I did, it was in the basement of the place I work. I was in my work uniform. It's out of focus. The sound is terrible. And there's a giant fly buzzing around the room, which I think I commented on. I remember it. Yeah, me too, very vividly. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I have to film that four or five times. And I remember thinking, I can't get it in focus. Why can't I get it in focus? And then I went home and messed around with the camera and went, oh, I just got to turn it that way. And it went in focus, but I'd already uploaded it. So I was like, ah, well, never mind. I'll live for next time. Um, there was one particular commenter whose name i won't mention uh he's sadly now unsubscribed from the channel uh, i think was like four videos in but there, there was a little bit of negativity and i'll always take that on board I, I work in retail you know so it's and i've been a musician in the past and all these kind of things and a barman so i know about negativity and i hopefully how to deal with people and you try and be professional and positive but sometimes you can never please everyone but luckily in the nearly two years i've been running the channel and thinking of ideas and new new ways to do things um we've gained so many more new fun fresh-faced individuals and we've kept a lot of the old guard too which i was very thankful for and very respectful to all of you that stuck around because you could have just gone nah, this guy's got no idea what he's talking about 
But luckily, you all stayed, and I was very happy for that. So thank you all. But uh, I've been chatting to Joe, and Joe is wanting to involve himself a little bit more again. Not not consistently, but um, there are a couple of whiskeys that I've got lined up that Joe would be very interested in giving his opinion on. And hopefully, if I can time things correctly, and hopefully it might be next week, uh, he's in Manchester for a little bit. And there's a point, I think, later on in the year where I'm in Birmingham with a camera. So I'm hoping we can kind of cross paths, do a very kind of run-of-the-mill video, like set it up in someone's living room and just film it and bring him in because I think a lot of people will be grateful to see his face again. As I said at the start of the video, he misses doing this so much. Um, He literally started this as a hobby. And if you watch the very first video on this channel, I think it's him reviewing. It's either, I think it's Lagavulin in 16, the first ever video that he he did in his living, in his mum and dad's living room in like this old armchair. Very Joe, very, very Joe Ellis. And to look at where it's come now, and to what we do now on a weekly basis, except this week, because I forgot. <laughs> um, you know, Joe's very happy of where it is. He's, you know, he loves he loves the production. There's nothing we do that he's against. And if he, if there was something he thought was a bit wrong, we would change it, and I would change it because even though I run the channel now, I've never. I don't think I'll ever feel like it's mine. It's not. I didn't grow it myself. I've somewhat stepped in to take over. And if at any point Joe wants to do it professionally in himself again, I will happily step aside and be like, it's yours, man. You take it over. I'll hand the reins back. Um, but I enjoy doing it and it's fun and changing the location up, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, bringing in, and I understand that everyone can bring in like a professional film crew, but we don't look at it like that. It's just, we're all friends. So it's just like, we get in, we shoot some fun videos. We all get to taste the whiskey. We have a good laugh with the bar, man- the bar managers and stuff. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's just fun for me. Like, you know, it's, it's nice to get away from my job, which is selling whiskey for a living. And to just come and just talk about it, because that's the thing I think we all love the most is to talk about this kind of thing. And me and Vin were chatting before the video went live, and I was saying to him, it's it's very interesting to watch, you know, Vin's videos and Roy's videos and Scotch Sess Dummies and uh, Malted Man Cave and you know uh, all these guys that are kind of kicking around <coughs> on the the YouTube circuit, and th- you know the difference in camera usage and the difference in opinion and how they do the reviews and the opinions they have on certain things within the industry um i don't think we've peaked at the minute i think there's a lot more to come but at the minute the wealth of whiskey knowledge and attentiveness that is within the videos and opinion um i don't think you'll see this you know shrink in any way i think it's only going to grow in the next couple of years so people like me and you've got our work out for us quite a bit then to keep it fresh and keep it interesting oh, definitely. Um, um, but yeah to take over was a, a cool thing um which got better the more I did it. So the more you work at it, the better you'll become, like with anything, you know? Absolutely, yeah. Um, just a quick thank you to Agravita. He says, sent across a super chat for me. He says, for Vin's consistency and dedication and Phil's discerning palette. Um, I like that, you know. Um, I don't have the best palette in the world, for sure. But uh, I do manage to get um, two videos out every week. Uh, yeah, which, man, that's, um, that's, hard. that's hard work, you know. That's not easy. Yeah. <laughs> as, you, as you've discovered um, today, it is hard work, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> As again, my lack of upload. I, I apologize to anyone who's watching this who's like, "Where's your video today?" Because I was yeah. like, "I'm I'm still so jet lagged from coming back from New York. I didn't sleep on the flight there. I didn't sleep on the flight back. I didn't sleep in New York because it's New York. You don't sleep in New York." Um, I had a friend around the day I landed, so I didn't go to sleep till one a.m. I woke up at seven a.m. and then yesterday I had a Lenny Kravitz gig in Manchester, which I got back home at two o'clock and then woke up today at six to go to work. So how I'm still functioning is beyond me, but whiskey is fueling me through it quite nicely, which is very nice. Absolutely. Uh, also, another super chat from Mark Broder. Cheers, buddy. That's um, from Scotch for Dummy. You should definitely check them out. And yeah, I will, man. Else, uh, Joe Ellis has just turned up in the chats. Joe. Hey, Joe. I was thinking just before we went live, I really should have uh, pinged him and uh, got him in as a, as a wee little cameo just to say hello to everybody, but uh, I completely forgot. Um, well, he, he can share his love in the comments, but Joe, your message that you sent to me has been shared. Um, we all know how much you miss doing this and how much you enjoyed it so much. But he's here now in the comments. So if you have any questions for Joe, like when is he going to take the channel back? I'm sure he can answer that question directly for you. Absolutely. Um, and I've, I've said it once, and I'll say it again. I'm, I'm super glad that he did hand it over to you because when he did, it made me the uh, Midlands premier whiskey channel. It does, man. You've got, the, you've got the monopoly on the situation down there at the minute. I think... <laughs> 
uh, other than Andy, who runs a cool little channel called Maltbox, uh, Andy at Maltbox, I think I'm the only guy in Manchester. I think. Yeah. And unfortunately, um, yeah, Andy doesn't really record much anymore. Um, so no, nah, you know, people get busy with work and stuff. I get that, but um, yeah, I think I'm the only one, not in the northwest, but <clears throat> certainly in Manchester for sure. Which again, you know, it's kind of cool. Um, having people come into the shop and go, "Yo, Whiskey Wednesday," I'm like, "Ah, oh, it's like the closest I'll ever get to being a celebrity." That's kind of cool. Do you want my autograph? No, okay, fine. Don't worry about it. Yeah, I think we just lost video for a second there. I didn't lose anything here, so hopefully people uh, can do it again. You can still see me, hopefully. Yeah, I can still see you, but uh, I don't know. Hopefully, maybe just uh, if everyone can hear us, just give us a little refresh or something if you're still having problems, but um, all looks fine my end. Yeah, I've got good feedback. Um, we kind of uh, skipped over the dram, but I've, I've just poured myself the about uh, 91. I don't know if you want to move on. I, to shall, it. I shall join you. Um, just to cover that Tullamore Dew, because yeah. obviously Joe, Joe's in the comments, and I mentioned that Joe was the reason I bought that whiskey. Um the Tullamore, it's it's super fresh. It's really light. It smells like kind of you know apples and kiwis. It's this really exotic palate, and with it being a single malt, the finish is still quite light because it's triple distilled. But I kind of describe it like an Ockentoshin with a bit more attitude. It's got a bit more spice, got a bit more punch, um, and it's just a such you know a bit more interesting a style when it comes to triple distilled whiskey. Whereas this twenty, I said it was twenty seven in the video I did, but it's apparently it's twenty six years old. Um, this thing is remarkable. Now, I'll let Vin just kind of smell and taste it because it is an unbelievable single malt. Uh, I bought this because it came to the shop and it's like 130 quid a bottle for a 26-year-old single malt, which is, in current market pricing, unfathomable from any other distillery, maybe with the exception of Glendronach. And I love the 90. I, I used to love the 97. I really like the 2003. And the current 2000 is really good as well. Uh, and I bought this and I tried it and just kind of went, that's one of the best old whiskies that I've ever tried. And for those of you that are Ralphie aficionados and, you know, don't do anything until Ralphie gives it a thumbs up. He did this review, I think it was yesterday or the day before. I think he gave it a 90. I gave it a nine and a half. Um, and everyone I've talked to has sung its praises. And to be fair, you meet anyone and talk about Bile Blair. I've never heard a bad opinion of this distillery. It's always been very positive. Um, this whiskey is like, how do you describe it? It's like if you take chocolate orange and like fudge and chocolate mixes and put it in booze and then let it macerate for ages. And then the finish is, you know, it's herby and it's savory. It's a bit spicier. It's a bit kind of classic Highland if you want to use that kind of style. But as far as a whiskey goes, I think that is nearly unbeatable in a singular category of it's nearly 30 years old. It's sub 200 pounds. It's only just above 100 pounds, really. It's 46%. There's no coloring in it. There's no filtration. It's a beautiful selection of barrels. And, you know, the guys, I've been up to the Barbell Distillery and it's in the middle of nowhere. And the tour is beautiful. And the whiskeys taste amazing. And as much as I don't want to admit it, the whiskeys always taste better at the distillery, no matter where you are. They always, always. do. Um, yeah, it's the same with Guinness. It, it, you, you oh, can't absolutely. Get it absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. If you try Guinness at Guinness, it's like it will never get better than this. Like yeah. it will never be served better. It will never be the perfect temperature ever again. Well, I've, is... I poured it myself in Guinness as well. I did the. Uh, oh, did you? That's cool. Yeah, and then took it up to the Sky Bar, and it was just bliss. But they do yeah. make you walk up eight floors of exhibits before they give it to you, so that not everything's going to taste good there, aren't they? So. Yeah, I think that's that's just like an Irish test more than anything. It's just <laughs> yeah. like how far are you willing to go for this brand? You yeah. want to climb eight floors? Okay, you can do that. You feel free to climb eight floors. But well, yeah, the. the the I'm nose glad you on this. this 91 because um, it's the first time I've, I've been able to try it, but I've, I've also got the 99 here. This oh, is nice, the, man, yeah. Yeah, this is the first release, the airport release. I've only got a I job have... left, but I was bought this when I was best man for my friend, so I'm going to review oh, cool. this soon because I'm going to have to kill that. That's It's yeah, I... to sit there for too long, I think. I bought a bottle of that when I was at Bal Blair because they had it in stock. And I was like, have you got this? It's like a travel retail. They are like, well, we make, we make it. I went, oh, yeah, of course. Um so I picked up a bottle of that and I drank it. Well, I drank it. Four of us drank it as we were camping in the, the northeast highlands of Scotland um, with a fire and like marshmallows and bacon and everything. It's great. So I've got really fond memories of this distillery. And I'll let you, I'll let you try it and enjoy it because yeah, <coughs> it, it is. I've kind of it in the background, but it's, that's it. I mean, it's incredible. It's got. It is. It's the depth of flavor just on. Uh, Whiskey is an amazing thing. You think, you know, it's three, three ingredients, four technically if you include a barrel. Five, if you include a master distiller and a blender. Um, it's just these four things kind of put together in a barrel. And 
tasting whiskey is amazing. Getting drunk is a happy byproduct of it. But the smell is my most favorite thing on the planet. Um, and this whiskey in particular, it's like chocolate orange and like kind of gooey, fudgy brownie things and cinnamon and powdered sugar and almonds and nuts. And I have a, I'm naturally a sweet tooth anyway. And this thing just sick, sits so high, in my opinion, of what other whiskies of this age now have to do to compete with it. Absolutely. Uh, I don't think anyone will ever compete with the price point. I think it's anywhere between 120 to about 135. Um, I can't think of another distillery that does that good quality whiskey, that older whiskey for that kind of money. Yeah, I mean, even um, like Highland Park 18, which um, even four years ago was 80 quid, is now sort of mm. 120. Yeah, like 110, 120 for sure. And that is an amazing whiskey, but, and I love Highland Park to bits, I really do. Mm. The 12 is one of my favorite bottles of all time. But that thing, that Bar Blair 91, I hope someone at Bar Blair is watching this. If you are, hello. <laughs> yeah, um, I hope they are as well. But I, yeah, that'd be, that'd be lovely. They might see something. They might see something in the future. But yeah, like just props to you guys because every whiskey you've ever released that I have ever had the privilege to try, <clears throat> never had a, like a bad thought to even say about it. Mm -hmm. And that's quite, again, it's a bit of an unusual thing to say in modern whiskey because every brand's got its problems. Every brand's got its issues with finding casks and sourcing barrels and pricing problems and the wealth of demand that is currently in whiskey is the most it's ever been. But Bal Blair consistently just keep on hitting that target, bang in the middle, from like 40 quid a bottle through to, I think their most expensive whiskey is like a 69 vintage, which is like maybe a couple of grand. Um, that I would rip someone's arm off to try that in a, in a heartbeat. But yeah, if you've never tried them, please do. Um, you can buy sample kits. You can If you want to risk on a full bottle, feel free to. But yeah, truly phenomenal whiskies um, and a distillery that is hard to beat in many different ways. I don't think it's even a risk. I mean, um, I, I, like you say, I tried a few. Uh, like the first one I ever got was this 99. I've had this for, for, for years now. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I thought, well, that's that's about as old as I'd want to go. That's it's it's um, sorry, as young as I want to go. But then I tried some of the ones bottle, uh, that were distilled in the 2000s and onwards. Mm -hmm. And even the younger ones, they, they don't put it in a bottle unless it's good, in my opinion. I mean, they're, they're basically making whiskey for my palate. Yeah, pretty much, man. Like, if you try what well, the current the current range is, as in like what you can buy in every shop now, two thousand five vintage, which just smells like summertime, crisp and light and fruity. It's like a really good white wine, the O five. If you're into wine, um, crisp and fruity, nice dry kind of savory finish. Then two thousand smells like creme brulee and caramel, but it's got this awesome like black peppery finish. This is the night one. Like every time I drink this, I expect like clouds to part and the sun to shine on me individually, and like you know, noise occurs. Led Zeppelin plays or something like that. <laughs> um, and then you know, previous to this, when the when I put the video out for the ninety one, everyone was going the nineteen ninety second release is like one of the best things I've ever tried. I'm like, I know I have one upstairs. I bought it for like nine, ninety something pounds a couple of years ago, and you can still find it in the wild now for like it's a little bit more. It's like a hundred and maybe like creeping towards one hundred and ten, one hundred and twenty. Um, but that is an astonishing whiskey. And the second release is 27 years old. And to think that you can pick that up for that amount and that thing just tastes like Jamaican ginger cake. Mm. It's beautiful whiskey. Uh, when I open it, samples will be sent to certain other whiskey reviewers to give their opinion on it because there's not a large list, but that 1990 second release, I think, is on my short list of one of the best whiskeys I've ever tried. That list will obviously grow with years to come, as all of ours will. Yeah, but absolutely that has been on like the top five list for at least two, two or three years now. And it's still not moved from there either. In fact, I think a couple of years ago, Joe gave it his whiskey of the year, but that might've been the first release. So like maybe two, three years ago. Something okay. Like yeah. Astonishing distillery, really good brand. Um, don't mess about. They're not trying to fool you in any way at all. Um, and what they make is just consistently good. I'm going to add a little bit of water to it because I never have before. Okay. Okay. Just to, just to see if that switches up, because I've only ever tried it straight. And while we've got the opportunity with some people watching, you know, it's probably worth seeing if it changes. I'm game. After my last live stream with uh, with Roy, I'll I'll give it a go. I'll get me fifth pet here. Oh yeah, man, I saw that. And you know, water is a very important thing. It makes up a good percentage of the bottle. And something I say to people on a daily basis, which isn't something I do on the channel. I don't know why. Maybe we should do it a little bit more. But I think if you're ever trying anything new. And I remember you saying that, you know, if you get sent a really small sample, there's not really a point 
to, to adding water because you've got such a small amount to work with, you kind of want to save for everything. And I, I totally understand that. Um, but, you know, if, if you've spent a bit more money on like a half bottle or like a 20 CL or something like that, you know, try it, leave it in the glass for like 20 minutes, half an hour. Go and do something else. Let it breathe. Let it get its kind of its mojo going. Come back, try it neat, make some notes. Notes are a very important thing. Um, I personally think the best way to develop a palate and a sense of smell, as good as your memory may be, is to write these things down. Always do it. Um, I've been doing it for years. I think that's that's the main reason I've progressed is just like making different notes and things. You'll see consistencies through distilleries and uh, releases and that kind of thing. It's quite nice. And then add a little bit of water. You know, add literally, you've got a pipette there. I've just poured some in from this glass. But a pipette is a great thing. Add one drop, taste it, make notes. Add two drops, taste it, make notes. Because at the end of the day, if you bought a full bottle, you're only you're only like sacrificing, for want of a better word, one drams worth of whiskey. If you've only got a miniature, I get it, it's cool. Drink it all straight, enjoy it, because then you can, if you like it, you'll buy the full bottle and experiment. But yeah, always think about water, always add water. And think of it as like a blank canvas, you know. Whiskey's got so much going on, and the smells, the finishes, the taste, the profile. You get a little bit of water, it just kind of releases all these other things and when I talk about adding water to whiskey, my head always pictures like a Jackson Pollock painting. Yeah. And I don't know why, but like you just get these little kind of these dabs of flavor and these things that kind of interject and cross. And, you know, you'll never fully understand the product unless you do experiment with it a little bit. And water is the perfect thing to do uh, with any whiskey, especially these older styles too, because they will just maybe not give you loads more flavors and tasting notes, but certainly just something a bit more individual. I think it eases it a little bit. I mean, especially on this one, I noticed it, it had like a, a nice little zing to it before that I, I, yeah. mean, I like that sort of thing. Me too. Uh, adding a touch of water has just eased that off a little bit and it's allowing some of the softer flavours to come through. Absolutely. There's like um, there's some really nice notes. There's like kind of an apricot thing going on in there, mm. a little bit more orange skin. Um, you know, if, if you ever dared to make an old fashioned cocktail out of this, it's kind of got that thing going on a little bit. But yeah, you know, with the whiskey with such age and it spent so much time in a selection of these kind of you know dry vessels of wood there's going to be some small element of vanillin or lignin or you know tannic profile that you won't pick up without adding a bit of water so i do actively encourage it um if you don't agree with me that's fine don't worry about it but i, I won't so but you know the full way to get these experimental flavors is to really dip into this whiskey if you pardon the pun of it but you know really kind of throw your nose in experiment a little bit more and just see what you can pull out because some whiskies work with water, some don't. But you'll only ever know that if you try it. And that's the most important thing. So I rambled on a bit there. I do apologize. We've still got two more whiskies to go. But we yeah. are. Well, actually, I was just going to say uh, that you've just segued to it nicely. We're about um, sort of 30 minutes into the stream now. So yeah, I've just, I've, just seen my, I've just seen my clock there. Yeah, I was like, oh, shit, I need to. <laughs> I've already pre the next one. So I'm kind of choosing for us. But I think we should do Method of Madness next. Absolutely. Um, absolutely, indeed. This brand is so cool. Um, I've got the bottle there. So this is um, it's a single grain whiskey. And for those of you that have watched my channel, um, you know how much I love bourbon. I love grain whiskeys too. I think it's a super underrated part of the market. And if you've never tried a grain whiskey, I can't stress to you enough how much you should probably go out and buy a bottle of Compass Box Hedonism because it is, and this isn't sponsored by Compass Box. I don't work for them. But you, that was the first grain whiskey I bought a full bottle of that wasn't bourbon. And that thing just lit my world on fire with all these kind of subtle little banana flavors and like, you know, creme caramels and creme anglaise flavors. And then you dip into single grain and, you know, you find out it's so important in blends and every big whiskey company in the world owns grain, but they don't do a lot with it. Along came Hay Club, ripped the market apart for both good and bad reasons uh, and still is doing now. Um, and then Irish boys kind of said, you know, we've got loads of grain whiskey. We make blended whiskey for a living. It's what we build our market on. Jameson's is, you know, the most, one of the most sold blended whiskeys on the planet, especially in like, uh, you know, the East Coast of America, in Boston, New York. So I can't remember the, the people's names involved with this because there's so many of them, but there's so many distillers and blenders. Method of Madness is essentially Middleton, Middleton's approach to letting younger apprentices within the whiskey industry experiment. And experimentation is such an important part of what spirits in general is about from the old school history of like, you know, from 1604, even later back than that to like 4,000 BC and, you know, al cool and the sound, you know, coming from the Persian words and for alcohol and that kind of thing all the way up to now and what we're doing. And this is a single grain whiskey. 
bottled at 46 percent um i don't know about coloring i've no idea about chill f- uh, filtration it doesn't really state anything but made by middleton biggest distillery in ireland responsible for 70 percent of irish whiskey and they finished it so it's been matured mainly in bourbon barrels or ex-bourbon casks for most of its life it's about 10 years old and then they finished it in spanish virgin oak uh, and I've, I've done my research on european oak and american oak and the differences European oak for me, and I've always said this in the in the videos, it is a kind of robust, dirty, kind of naughty approach to oak. It's a very, very kind of raw style. Um, and a lot of single cast Craig Ellicky, uh, sherry cast especially, focus on European oak because it brings out that kind of weird element of Craig Ellicky that we all love. Um, and as a bourbon fan, as a grain fan, when I see virgin oak, I'm like, right, I'm sold. I'll take it. That's mine but I've never tried Spanish virgin oak. And when we filmed the video for this, I was surrounded by like Jameson's barrels, like a Jameson's cask. It looked like it was sponsored by Jameson's, but the whiskey jar just has loads of cool Jameson's props around. Um, And I did get invited to a Jameson's tasting after this, but that's a story I can't tell on the internet. Um, And this whiskey just did so many different things. I'm going to pour a little dram of it. Uh, I think Vin's already got his glass. So if you want to have a little smell, dude, and kind of... There's some really unusual tasting and smelling notes with this thing. And I don't really pay attention to what the official notes are on the bottle, but there's one on this that really sort of sings out. Mm. It's, it's got a really uh, interesting nose on it. It's um, It does. It's very unusual. I like, I mean, so uh, Well Story is saying, what the fuck is, uh, ooh, I'm actually, that's the first time I've sworn on one of my own videos in a long time. Cheers, Well It, it was going to happen at some point, man, yeah. WTF is uh, Spanish Virgin Oak. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've never really tried any Spanish version of it, but I guess it's what uh, they... they so all, cherry all it is, yeah, it's all it is. It's, it, it's sherry oak that hasn't been... Uh, not all sherry bodegas char their oak, um, but all they've done is Middleton have gone to a certain bodega and they've said, what's that? They're going, oh, that's virgin oak. We've not touched it. Nothing's been in it. And they've gone, okay, we'll take however many barrels of that. We'll take it back to Ireland. We'll stick some grain in it and just see what happens. And... The one specific smelling note that this thing gives off, which I can't agree with more because it reminds me of being in primary school, is that it smells of pencil shavings. And it says it on the back of the bottle. I'll see if I can get it on the camera for you. Um, yeah, nose. New pencil shavings and grapefruit and a few other things. Um, <laughs> there's some very, I mean, that's power of persuasion, so now I've said it, you might be thinking it. But I yeah, smelled it and went... Uh, I I agree with it so much. I'm like, it does actually smell like I've a sharpened a pencil, and you don't actually get the oak influence or the the virgin oak influence of this until the very end of the whiskey. So on the nose, it's kind of light, it's kind of fruity. It's a typical grain. There's an element of spirity, somewhat abrasive nature, kind of hidden in the back of it. Mm-hmm. But once you actually try it, it is uh the finish is just different and a bit weird. Yeah, I mean, I've I've done a lot of grains recently, um, and I've been saying about how you have, man, yeah, uh, like aged grain. It's something something wonderful happens to grain when it's been sat in a barrel for twenty years. Oh, dude, like when you start talking about like twenty five, thirty year old mm-hmm. grain whiskies, honestly, like if you haven't tried them, I was thought I tried a thirty year old Strathclyde the other day, and it was like drinking fresh black currants and mint julep cocktails. It was so amazing. So I bought one just on the spot because it was 120 quid for a 30-year-old whiskey, which is a no-brainer straight away. Um, but sorry, I interrupted you. Carry on, Vid. Carry on. No, no problem. No problem. Um, I just think, like, uh, so with the virgin oak, so that's something I've been really getting into recently, because I've been getting into mm. a lot more bourbons. Um, you have, yeah. Scotch is uh, something I've, I've known for a long time, and it's been kind of held together by the uh, the ex-bourbon market, I, I, would, I would say. It's made it quite cheap. So oh yeah, for sure. Having yeah. proper like virgin oak stuff. Like, we we talked about this in the pre-show, but I've just picked up this. Anyone who knows about it, yep. This is the Brewdog uh, single grain, but this is done aged in American virgin oak. Uh, you see, it's quite light still. It's nothing like actual bourbons, but it's incredible what a virgin oak barrel can really do to a whiskey. It is a, it is a very unusual style of wood, and when I talk about the comparison of bourbon to Irish, to Scotch. There's obviously so many, there's so many variables that you can talk about. But if you just talk about cast selection, American oak is very sweet and very spicy due to numerous different things. But the spice is from the cask. And if you look at it as kind of like a graph, 
American whiskey, it's a very spiky kind of flavor. Like you get loads of spice, you get loads of sweetness, and that kind of, you know, it kind of dry in the finish. If you exclude peated whiskey from the Scotch chart, it's a much more subtle style with bourbon influence. It's not as dry. It's much more kind of welcoming. You get the caramel and the butterscotch without the really intense side of it. And then Irish whiskey, you know, capitalizes massively on ex-bourbon barrels. The sherry cast stuff is a little bit more expensive, as it is with scotch. Um, but being triple distilled as well, it just adds that extra element of kind of elegance and refinedness to it in terms of the palate and the taste anyway. I don't like the word, but, you know, you could call it very smooth. Smooth. What, yeah, I had <laughs> issues with that word. But uh, moving on. With virgin oak, it's going to give you these big flavors. And European oak typically is used for sherry barrels or port barrels or port pipes. Um, a lot of sherry casts these days are actually made from American oak because it's a much more consistent type of oak. Um, European oak, you know, it's kind of knotty. It's a bit of a mongrel of breed of different kinds of trees. And, you know, it's not very consistent in any way. Whereas to, to do a virgin oak finish, this isn't what I would describe as an intense whiskey in any way. But you do get that subtle bit of kind of dryness and oak within the finish of this product. And it is 46%. Uh, as I've said, I've, I've no idea about coloring or filtering. It's getting a bit dark on my end in terms of the room because I've only got one light on. But it's not a very it's dark whiskey. Laptop. Yeah, I need to hit the laptop screen again. It's not, a, it's not a very dark whiskey in any way. It's quite a light product. Um, Middleton and Jameson's obviously, you know, they, add, they add coloring to their products. Um, it's more for consistency than anything else. I don't really look at it as a bad thing, but when it is non when it is non coloured, it's always cool. You know, you like that. But as far as summer whiskies go, sticking in with the theme of the channel, uh, the, or this live stream, I should say, I think you could pour that straight on ice if you want to get experimental with cocktails. You know, that and like you know maybe like a, a whiskey sour or something quite would be quite interesting. Um, and going back to the theme of experimentation, no matter as whiskey enthusiasts, if you take the fact we run YouTube channels away from it. And the people who are watching this, we all just really like whiskey. That's the, the end products. Um, the products we can drink and consume today are around because of experimentation. Certain individuals doing certain things with barrels, with distillation, with levels of char and mash bills and all that kind of thing. And it's something that goes on so much in the modern industry and I think isn't talked about enough. Because no matter, as a consumer, if you sit there and go, I think such and such should do this and do that and do this, they've probably done it. Uh, but they've just not released it because, you know, maybe it just didn't work. So yeah. um, the idea, like Glenn Farkless fans going, you know what, I would love a little bit of peat. It's like, well, they probably do use a little bit, but in terms of, like, you know, a Kalila style Glenn Farkless, which would be so cool. I'd be all over that. I'd be like, I want that in this area of my my face. Um, maybe they did it and just kind of, you know, maybe it doesn't really work for our spirit. It doesn't work for the cast selection. So we'll leave it. Um, American distilleries do experimentation more than anyone due to the limitations they have on their products. Store, you know, so you know they get variety and flavor from storing in warehouses that are like you know six, eight floors high, um, changing the mash bill slightly to include more rye or more malted barley, more corn. And the Irish boys, um, going back to Middleton, they're so big and they're responsible for so much of the world's whiskey, world's Irish whiskey. The experimentation for them is something that is, you know encouraged quite a lot and they always release experimental stuff and you can just look at the regular jameson's range and go you've got the standard one which is like what 18 20 quid in a supermarket it's a great whiskey like it gets slammed because it's cheap but i i do quite like standard jameson's you know you've got the castmates which uses different ipa barrels and stout casks and the crested which uses you know a lot of sherry cask influence you might not taste it too much but it's there the black barrel, which is like heavily charred bourbon casks. Then you've got the Jameson's Gold, which is virgin oak, and Jameson's 18, which is like drinking silk if it was ever liquidized. Um, so for me, Irish whiskey within the European continent we live in is the most experimental and the most, not necessarily the most forward thinking, but certainly the, the country that releases more of these experimental styles. And when I saw this, and as I was telling Vin in the pre-show, I literally saw an advert for this on Royal Mile, which is a company I've never shopped with before. And it's kind of went, single grain virgin Spanish oak. I was like, right, I'm just having that. It was 46 pounds, which isn't expensive in any way at all. And you know, that's what a bottle of Glendron at 12, roughly, right? So you think, I can, for the same money, I can get this weird Irish grain whiskey that's finished in a barrel I've never heard of before. And it's just going to offer me something a little bit different. Uh, that's what I think is really cool about the whiskey industry at the minute, because if you ignore the age statement thing and 
the reset the recession of that a fun way to get around age statements is to make things experimental and kind of funny uh so like what glenn fiddick did with the xx and the ipa mm-hmm. i loved both of those whiskeys so much uh, it's because they made it a bit fun and made it quite interesting for the consumer and i think uh the irish boys have always been really good at doing that they've always had always had a good sense of humor they you know historically do and to go you know what spanish virgin oak grain and most people go what but he's like, you know what? we're just going to release it if it doesn't work it doesn't work but I think there'll be a market for it. And luckily, you know, it's within this community. People are willing to, you know, sacrifice 40, 50 pounds and they're going, if it's good, it's good. If it's not, I'll trade it for something else for with a friend. Um, but yeah, single grain, virgin oak, very unusual. Two words that go together quite well, typically in history. But when you include the word Spanish and when you use Quercus rebor, which is, you know, European oak, red oak, it does give you just these slightly interesting drying tannic levels of flavor compared with a fruity light bourbon influenced single grain absolutely absolutely I mean, i've really enjoyed that one uh, it's a bit different um compared to the one sure. the other the other two but in a good way like you say um, i'm a huge fan of experimentation in whiskey and i feel like um especially when certain things like bourbon and the uh the scotch whiskey association there's so many like traditional bookends yeah. on what you can do um i'm really Absolutely. enjoying things that uh, like europeans are doing at the moment uh really enjoying things that are coming out of uh, asia and stuff like that because they don't have these limitations they can do whatever the hell they want but like no. you said a little bit earlier they they might be rehashing old ideas that we've never seen because someone did it 20 years ago smelt it and gone ah that's awful i can't release that yeah but maybe the climate makes a difference i don't know but I, i'm enjoying I'm enjoying the experimentation of everything and I'm enjoying trying all these new things that are coming out, uh, new ways of distilling. Like yeah. um, there's a new distillery going up. Uh, I forgot what they're called now. Um, the one in Yorkshire. Uh, the, uh, Coop, Cooper that, King. The what? Cooper King. Cooper King. That's it. Yeah. Well done. Um, they've imported a still from New Zealand. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, uh, they they shipped it over because they spent some time in New Zealand, which is, you know, they didn't have to do that. They could have just... Cool. Weird, it's kind of stocky and, and flat and it's got like, wide and then it comes in and goes up. So it's okay. it's going to produce a very interesting uh, flavour profile depending on what stuff they chuck in it. But, Did you say it was quite... Uh, why not, you know? Do you say it was quite a short kind of still? Quite short and fat? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's rather than it being like a, a bulbous round kind of thing it's, it's, it's a bit a, more square uh, yeah it's a little, a little bit more square so i'm i'm, I'm assuming that it will let less up into the into the neck a bit yeah i mean it sounds like they're probably going to go for like with a shorter still anyway with like quite squared angles they probably want like a heavier oilier style of whiskey so you know like a like a berlin or like a macallan which to be fair is not a bad thing to aim for at all in in, in any way but i actually met the the two people who own it at the york whiskey festival last year Mm-hmm. unfortunately i can't remember your names because i was drinking amaret cast strength so i do apologize on behalf of that um but they gave me their business card and we were just chatting away and um they seem like really nice genuine passionate people and english whiskey isn't something i've had a lot of experience with i've tried the stuff from the lakes which i do quite like um it leans toward a sweeter style which is indicative for me anyway um, but I do need to experiment more with English whiskey. So like English Whiskey Co., I've not tried much from. There's a distillery in Devon, whose name I always forget. But it's quite expensive, but apparently it's very nice. Um, and just a few, I need to kind of dive into my local produce a little bit more and see what's going on. Because so far, I've, I've done whiskey from all around the world, and I've ignored the domestic elements of it, which I feel a bit bad about. So you'll see more English whiskeys kicking around on the channel in the next couple of months, for sure. Yeah, do it. Um, yeah, um, is that you pouring your uh, next one I just saw there? Oh. Yeah, is that the uh, the whiskey that the Glen Scotia 18? I will thing. constantly buy for the rest of my life <laughs> if it's available. Well, I'll so say while um, you're pouring that, a question's directly come in from uh, Eric Wade. He says, do you or your guests oh, cool. think the recent renaissance of Scotch whiskey is influencing changes and new distilleries in Ireland? I would say almost definitely yes. Um, they look at Scotch and try to do things as different as possible while maintaining something similar. I would agree. Um, it, it, it boils down to history once again, because up until, I think it was the 1990s, um, there was only two distilleries in Ireland, really. You had Middleton and Bushmills. 
they were the only two distillers that were constantly making whiskey. Teeling opened up again recently, and Cooley opened up, I think, in the mid nineteen nineties. Feel free to correct me on that if I'm wrong. Um, so you know, you had you had four at most. One of them was producing most of the whiskey in the world for Ireland, and Bushmills recently, in the last four years, being traded for a, a tequila and now being owned by a tequila company. They've were assessed away from that single malt style. Like you can't. I actually retried the Bushmill 16 in a bar the other day and forgot how good that whiskey actually was. But you can't really buy Bushmill single malt anymore. It's all it's the more blended styles that are available, especially in travel retail, which is a you know, big thing for uh, blended whiskey. So I think a lot of Irish distillers have just kind of, in all honesty, got quite bored with trying the same whiskey over and over again. And if you were in Ireland growing up in the 1990s and the 1980s. You had such limitations to what was, you know, local and interesting and a bit different. And I think a lot of them is kind of, you know, what I'm gonna step out out the box and I'm gonna dedicate some time, some finance to making my own distillery. In regard to Eric's question, I guarantee of the twenty plus new distilleries that are opening in the next decade in Ireland, some of them are probably just gone. You know what? The Scottish guys are doing this. The English guys are doing this. We can do it as well. And they've probably got you know, some decent backing, some decent financial investment from some bigger companies and some bigger individuals. But I think a lot of them have just been these kind of small mum and dad people who have gone, well, if someone in the middle of Yorkshire can set up a still in their bedroom and make gin and whiskey, why can't I? And you've got to think at the end of the day, everything we're drinking in these glasses, it's all uh, you know, a bigger version of what essentially was a byproduct of farming at the end of the day, you know, you grew the grain, you worked really hard to grow it. You can't sell this bit, so I might as well use something for it so I'll distill it. And I think that method of thinking is worth working its way slowly back into the, the, the mind of the whiskey drinker. And you know, you can buy a still on eBay for 80 quid and buy some grain and make it yourself in your kitchen as long as you're very safe and follow health and safety rules because you know, alcohol fumes and all that kind of thing. Do be careful. Um, I'm also pretty sure that's uh, illegal without a license, Phil. I'd just like to say that... Um on air uh, we really encourage yeah, think, people to go ahead with that <laughs> no no i think it's you only require a license i think if you actually want to sell it okay okay i'll take that um or you make a certain amount per year because uh, i have a very good customer who bought a little still and made some grain distillate out of uh quinoa or quinoa however you say it quinoa. i've got confused between the english and the american version of that word um and he brought it in for me to try. It was actually really good. And I said to him, you should put that in a small barrel and age it. And he just drank it all because, um, you know, he made it himself. But I think you only need a license if you want to sell it. Um, if you just want to experiment and have a little bit of fun, do be safe. Do follow health and safety precautions. Um, but I think if you just want to do it in your kitchen as like a little one-off, you can kind of do that with ease. If there's any lawyers watching, I'm not legally binding to anything I've just said, so I do apologize. <laughs> Um, but I believe you do only need a license if you want to sell it or want to produce over a certain amount per year. Um, but do correct me if I'm wrong, because if I'm wrong, I will accept the fact I'm wrong. Um, but yeah, moving on from that, Ireland, whiskeys. as I said before, since 1990, Irish whiskey has been the biggest growing whiskey and spirit sector for the last 28 years. Most of that is down to Jameson's and Bushmills as singular products, without any doubt. Whereas... In Scotland, you've had such a wide variety of products making up such a large market consistency. And I think Ireland now wants that. They want peated, they want Spanish oak, they want virgin oak, they want bourbon, they want sherry, they want port. And they want to try something that's a little bit different from someone who uses different shil uh, still shapes and different you know, distillation methods, different fermentation times. Um, variety is the spice of life. It's a beautiful phrase. And I think Ireland is now welcoming in that in terms of its distillation products. And the next couple of years, as whiskey drinkers regardless if you dislike or like Irish whiskey, um, is very important for that little island off the coast of uh, England, or Britain, I should say. Um, so do keep an eye out, and if anything new comes out, I'm going to be jumping on it straight away, because mm. Irish whiskey is fantastic. I can't sing its praises enough. We owe a lot to it, because technically in the Western world, they were the first guys to get the license. Maybe not the first to distill, but the first to get the license. Um, but moving on, on to mm. this beautiful glass of whiskey, Glen Scotia 18. So I, I was going to say, um, I was going to bring it up after we've, we've had this one, but I think I've been drinking this a little bit while we've been chatting. Yeah, um, yeah. The, uh, the Bow Blair 91 is probably my favourite of the four, but this, I think, fits the bill of best summer whiskey out of the four. Agreed. It's, it's actually quite coincidental that we left it to last because I agree with you on this point. 
Um, for those of you that have seen the video I did on Glen Scotia 18, um, I know Roy from Aqua Vita in particular was in agreement with me that, it, you know, as a distillery goes, in the last couple of years, I've never seen a distillery come from literal rags to riches. Now, Glen Scotia distiller has always been good, but if you do have your computer spare at the minute or your phone, and if you don't miss out on anything we're about to say, if you Google Glen Scotia whiskey bottle and go on Google Images, you will see a selection of some of the worst looking bottles of whiskey I've ever seen in my entire life. They were bright pink and bright blue and bright green and had like Highland cows on the front of them, which is ironic because there's no Highland cows in Campbelltown. Um, the whiskey was great. It was phenomenal. Um, and then in the last couple of years, Lot Lomond came in, purchased Glen Scotia, and kind of went, look, let's stop doing all this silly stuff. Let's make the bottles really simple. And it is a very simple bottle. It's nothing particularly showy, maybe apart from the gold on the label. Um, and I remember when my, com my company, I don't own it, the company I work for, first started stocking these like last Christmas. And the double cask, the 15, were the only real things available. And a Victoriana, I think Campbelltown, you think Springbank, and you think, oh, it's got to compete with Springbank. And that's such a big deal to be able to compete with Springbank is like a massive thing. And I remember trying the double cask at 30 quid a bottle and going, that's ridiculous. Bourbon cask, Pedro Jimenez finish, 46%, no filtration, oily, sweet, rich, and spicy. You try the 15, which is mainly bourbon with a bit of sherry. And it just tastes like Klein Leash. It's got that kind of waxy, spicy thing going on with it. And then this came out. The 18 and a 25 followed it as well. Uh, it's 17 years and six months in bourbon, six months finish in Oloroso sherry, no peat whatsoever. It's the only whiskey in their range that I believe contains no peat whatsoever, along with the 25. And the first time I smelt this, it came into stock and I went, right, I'm just going to buy that. It's about 90 quid a bottle. It's not the cheapest thing in the world, but I'm just thinking the 15 is great. The double cast is great. I've tried the 25 and I bought a bottle of 25 because it was one of the best things I've tried. It's very subtle. And I've had many arguments with people about the 25 who went, it's not as good as I wanted it to be. I'm like, it's not meant to be. It's subtle. It's different. And then I bought this on a whim and just kind of went, you know what? Even if I don't like it, I'll drink it. And I bought it and I bought and I gave samples out to very good friends. They all bought a bottle as a result. And it isn't a whiskey that's going to hit you around the face with really intense, large flavor. And I have a problem with distilleries that produce 18-year-olds that typically are quite like this, that are a little bit subtle, and that, for want of a better word, you could use the word underwhelming. Um, personally, I'd use the word elegant mm -hmm. and refined to describe this whiskey. Because you try Macallan 18, and if you ignore the price tag, which is hard to do because it's nearly 300 pounds a bottle now, yeah, yeah. Um, I remember buying a bottle of 1993 Macallan 18 for about 120 quid and thinking, you know what, it's pretty good. And then I bought a 95 for 150 and just kind of went, it's not that good, you know. And I, I traded the rest of that bottle for something else because I was like, it's just not very good. And I look at it now and it's new fancy kind of V-neck polo bottle. And I'm thinking, it's £285. The 25-year-old version of this whiskey is 10 quid cheaper. And it's a 25-year-old. And at the end of the day, it's a number. It shouldn't matter, but it does to a lot of people. And the 25 is outrageous. Um, but 18-year-olds now for me, they're becoming a little bit more less interesting and they're becoming a little bit more lax in their approach to a lot of... I won't mention any distilleries in particular, but a certain number of distilleries, I think, have pulled back quite a lot on the 18-year-old mm -hmm. to save a lot of whiskey for the 25s, the 30s, the 40s, which, again, it's a business. You can't blame them for that. Um, but as a consumer and as a, as a buyer, I can, so I will. And I tried this, and I kind of thought, you know what? It's elegant and it's subtle, and it has everything I want in it, from a really fruity nose of kind of passion fruit and orange and a little bit of creme caramel, all the way through to a very delicate palate, almost, you know, minimalist, if you're going to talk about it. And it's a very minimalist palate. It's very few flavors. And then a finish, which is a little bit dry and a little bit erudite. It's very, you know, ethereal and it's easy drinking. And I remember thinking I should be upset with this whiskey, but I'm just not in any way at all. I also apologize if my face has just turned blue because my <laughs> computer has decided to update itself during this thing. Um, <laughs> Well, we always say there's always a tech issue or two. Um, what you need is a nice big uh, 500, 5,000 Kelvin bulb. That uh, yeah, you've got you've got a prop. I've got like a Blade Runner thing going on. There. It's very <laughs> kind of very cool. 
the downside of this is you also have to have the window open. Because I was going to say, you must be very hot because it's, it's like warm. 15, 16 degrees outside as well. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm in my shorts and uh, and no socks and everything just to kind of keep the heat off me. <laughs> uh, it's very cold in this house. I'm rocking a hoodie. Mm. Um, but yeah, this whiskey. And I was chatting to Vin before in the post show. And I didn't realize I'd done this until you all commented on it. But if you watched the review I did on this whiskey, everyone was like, oh my God, that pause was amazing. I was like, what pause? What are you talking about? And I rewatched the video and there's like a 90 second section of me just not saying anything. And what I also said to Vin in the pre-show was it's very difficult. Well, actually it's not, it's not very difficult at all. Um, as whiskey enthusiasts, which is something I've mentioned already. And I apologize if I'm repeating myself, but you can tell when Vin, myself, um, the wealth of guys in Canada, the wealth of guys in America, people like Roy, um you can tell when we really like a product it really comes across you know the passion kind of like oozes out it's like this is amazing you might not be able to afford it but it's really good um and you know the glen scotia is about 90 pounds a bottle uh which isn't the most expensive thing in the world it's kind of average for about 18 year olds right now and when we don't like something you can kind of tell because we get a little bit kind of like you know we're a bit underwhelmed by that but when I tried this whiskey for the very first time and I opened this bottle on that, on that review, I was like, you know what? It's as good as I remember be, it being. It's as good as it ever will be. And between this and Glendronic 18, they're probably the only two 18-year-olds that will be consistently sat on my whiskey shelf. Um, sadly, I think Glendron- Glendronic 18 is going to become ever more expensive because of it is 100% sherry and it's only going to be so cheap for so long. It's going to be the McAllen effect in a couple of years without a doubt. Um, but yeah, I can't sing the praises of this thing enough. I don't know what Vin thinks of it personally, but um, I know people who love this. They're massive fans. And you know what? It is subtle and it is delicate and it's not going to hit you around the face with oak. It's not going to slap you with sherry because it doesn't have a lot of sherry influence. But what a Rolls Royce of whiskey means for me is for something that's refined, dignified, and that offers you much more than what you could anticipate. Mm-hmm. And this does that in absolute bucket loads it is not the most ridiculous whiskey on the planet like i gave it i think a nine out of ten I think, yeah it was a nine out of ten and i will stick by that the bubble and i want to give a nine and a half out to because it's older and it's ridiculous value and there's so many flavors hidden within it but in terms of in the current market within 18 year old whiskies i think that will give you so much more flavor and so much more interest and just intrigue as a consumer within a distillery and a company than many other things can, uh, along with Glendronic, which I'm also a big fan of. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it's just a wonderful whiskey. I've gone on a quite a lot about that. So I, I, can't see, I still can't see the comments, so I do apologize if you've kind of been like, <laughs> this guy just doesn't stop talking. You can see why we keep the, uh, the Whiskey Wednesday videos to like three minutes because they get on a little bit. But we cut a lot of footage out of them. <laughs> I think, um, if anything, I think you might have hit your second wind after being uh, being jet lagged. But um, like you said, at the, at the pre-show and earlier on, it just goes to show like the reason why we any of us decided to sit up in our little rooms. Like someone said earlier, this is my little box room that I have a little yeah. room in. Yeah. And the reason why we decided to do it is because we like to talk about whiskey. And that is it. That is absolutely you know, it. I, mean, I, I, yeah. I don't know a lot about whiskey. You work in the industry, so you're exposed to it a lot more than I am. Yeah, I know what I know, and I like to talk about it to people that will listen. And thank absolutely, you. there's people out there that want to listen. I still don't get that, but they do. <laughs> as long as long as they will listen to us, we will do what we can do. And um, the beauty of it is, it's never growing industry. Like I, I chat to people on a daily basis who are like, "I've never tried whiskey before." It's like that's amazing. How have you never tried whiskey before? And they're like, "Oh, I'm 18. Oh, oh fair enough. You've never tried whiskey before." Um, um, but you chat to these older folks, you know, the people who are in the 40s and the 50s, and they say, I had a bad experience of whiskey once. And you're kind of like, okay, what was it? So oh, I was out for a birthday. I drank loads of Jack Daniels or Jameson's or Freud, and I just can't go back to it. And you kind of think, okay, well, what do you like? And you start chatting about other things like vodka or gin. Well, maybe not vodka, but you start chatting about gin, rum, and Armagnac and brandy. You think, okay, so if you like brandy, you like a sweeter style. You try Dalmore, you try Glendronic. You bring these things out and uh, just expose people to it. And there is such a wealth of stuff and such a large amount of product. And if you ever step into any whiskey specialist, be it the Whiskey Exchange, Master Malt, Whiskey Shop, Royal Mile, um, if you find yourself in America, places like Oak and Barrel or Whiskey Wine of 69 and a few other things, 
I was in New York recently, for those who didn't know, so I'm a, I only know New York whiskey shops. So I apologize to the rest of the country of America. Um, if you walk in and just chat to these people behind the till, you know, they should know what they're talking about because they stock it. And if you had a bad experience once, I apologize because, you know, no one should ever have had a bad experience of anything. Uh, for me, it's tequila, but I've come around to the style of tequila now. Oh. And it's it's such an interesting world. And, you know, if you're a bit of a history buff, I, I love history. It's one of the things I adore reading about. Uh, the history of whiskey, even if you don't like the spirit, just read about it. Because American whiskey is, it literally is like a Western. There's like the people involved, like people like George Remus and uh, George, oh, what was his name? There's a gentleman called George. I'll get back to you all about that. Um, you know, and Al Capone and the Prohibition era and all kind of things. So interesting. And I was chatting to Vin about when I was in New York. And in terms of new, fun, interesting people in the industry, there are people like, uh, Paul Fletco, who owns and distills a few distillery in Chicago, which was in a dry state, uh, a dry county within Chicago. Um, and he now turned up and he makes a, a gin and a whiskey and a rye and a bourbon and loads of other cool stuff. Uh, Alison Park, who is uh, one of the lead people behind Bren whiskey in France. If you have a sweet tooth, Bren smells and tastes like candy floss and bubblegum. It's a very kind of sweet style. But, you know, she's introducing an entire new element of people into whiskey and the more people who can get involved with it the more people like me and vin and everyone else involved can do stuff like this and chat to you and put videos out and talk about brand new things um but yeah you know it's it's an ever-growing industry it will continue to grow unlike gin and rum and a few other things it doesn't really go through fad uh builds because gin is anyone who knows or has seen gin knows how much of a build it's going through at the minute um but yeah, whiskey's been very consistent, has been in the last sort of 30-ish years. And hopefully we can continue to do things like this and just talk about whiskey. And I, can, I finally got the comments section loaded up. Uh, it's only taken an hour on my <laughs> computer to do this. And Nobody I, I, said anything bad about you, Phil. Don't worry about it. Oh, don't you worry. I'm going through the comments later on and I'll find out <laughs> if anyone has said anything bad. Um, and I can see so much love for Bal Blair in the comments. You know, like Connor yeah, Strang was mentioning, like, Blair. love the 1990, you know, would love to try something bottled in 2013. Um Jason comes. He's right. There's a lot of Jasons going on in this comment section. A lot of Jasons. A lot of Jasons. But yeah, you know, just talking about Bob Blair and chatting about a '91 and going, you know what? If you can afford it, it's great value because it's about the same price as a Johnny Walker Blue Label. And it's as much as I like Johnny Walker Blue Label, it's got a lot more going on, and it's a little bit more interesting. Hmm. So, you know, if you can, if you can afford to, you know, go in and buy it or buy a sample. If you come and see me at the whiskey shop in Manchester, I have a bottle open. Just chat to me. I'll give you a little sample to walk away with. It is my bottle, so you know I won't be too intense with the sample size. <clears throat> but yeah, crazy good. And Kevin Bryant, I'm just seeing your comment. Just got the Glen Scotia Peated Ruby Cast based on Phil's recommendation. Dude, outrageous. It's not as complex and weird as the 18, but it is a, an amazing whiskey. And I think it's my first 10 of the year so far. Um, and I think the first 10 of the year last year was a Bunnahaven Moyne followed by a Lagavulin 12. And Lagavulin 12 got my whiskey of the year last year. Yeah, um, that. Like Roy told me to buy a bottle and I didn't. And I think I put that video out and all of a sudden I started getting loads of mentions on Twitter and it was like, I've bought this based on Phil's recommendation. It's like, Jesus Christ. Like, if you don't like this, I've lost so many people so much money. And luckily, everyone who bought it loved it. And if you can still find it and it's still out there, it's still like 90 English pounds. And I don't think it'll go up any more than that. But honestly, last year's Lagavulin like 12, was the best lag of all. I've only tried four, but it was the best one I've tried. Um, I, I described it as a perfect whiskey, and nothing has beat that sentence and yet. Mm. So if you do like those perfect styles, do check out last year's Lagavulin 12. Again, this stream is not sponsored by Lagavulin or any Diageo content. Um, but as we all know, if you like peated whiskey, Lagavulin is outrageous. It's all very good. The 8 was great. The 12 is great. The 16 is great. The distillers is great. Um, yeah, Lagavulin. Awesome. Do check that one out if you can. And um, Blenskosha 18, uh, beautiful whiskey, just to kind of round it up because, I, again, I ranted on a bit. I feel like I'm uh, taking over this a little bit, Vin, so I do apologize. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, awesome whiskey. Uh, very, very, very balanced, very elegant, and just offers you something a little bit different as an 18-year-old. I should say, just before it disappears as well, I did get another super chat from uh, Kilted Moose. Um, he's one you of did, my... Yeah. Um, patreon uh, subscribers as well so thank you very much dude always appreciate any support you give uh, and a good opportunity for me to say thank you to all of my uh, patreon subscribers because you guys 
really do help out. Uh, I think I'm, I'm uh, getting more off uh, Patreon than I am off YouTube at the moment, which is superb. Just started putting in my tiers now. So there are some rewards there nice that weren't before. So hopefully people will start getting merchandise and things like that. Soonish, I'm working on it and it's an evolution, but glad to have you guys on board. Yeah, um, everyone yeah. likes a little bit of merch. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, I don't know about you, Phil, but this has been an absolutely brilliant stream. I think it's probably a good time to um, do a quick recap and, uh, and wind up. Um, yeah, for sure, man. I have I got in from work at eight o'clock and I've still not eaten dinner yet, so Ooh. that'd be cool. And I'm eating dinner with uh, Welsh Toro then because I'm surprised yeah. he hasn't left to go and make his uh, Spanish time dinner already. Yeah, I poured quite large portions too, so I'm feeling really good at this moment in time. It's uh, it's going to be a nice, easy get up at six o'clock in the morning for me. <laughs> Absolutely. But yeah, like I said a little bit earlier, just before the uh, Glen Scotia 18, I think um, the, the two uh, Irish were absolutely fantastic. And I think they... Uh, They're very good. Yeah. Um, maybe putting in some cocktails, which we didn't really cover tonight. But my favourite of the evening was the Bal Blair 91. But in terms of the summer whiskey, that Glen Scotia 18 was incredible. Uh, I really enjoyed that. And, and Campbelltown whiskeys is something that I'm... I'm not, I haven't really got into that much. I, I can't really get them where I am. I have to make a special trip to a specialist or whatever to get hold of it. Yeah. I just haven't yep. yet. And I will, I will. I will. If you can try anything, um, I'm actually running a tasting the next couple of weeks uh, for the company I work for. And it's going to be going back to the basics. And we don't actually stock Springbank as a company, but if you could just get hold of a bottle of Springbank 10, um, or even more specifically, if you like the PTA stuff, Long Row Gold, which I think is about thirty-eight pounds a bottle, mm -hmm. and it is outrageous. Like that whiskey is, it has like the nose and the palate of that Glen Scotia, but it's a little bit smoky at the end. Um, Long Row is great. Glen Scotia is awesome. Springbank is unreal. Hazelburn, I've never really been a fan of, but that triple distilled styles in Scotch whiskey has never really sat well with me. Anyway, I'm not a Rosebank fan. I'm not really a Knock and Toshin fan. Um, I will reply to that comment because I've just seen that. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, there's loads of cool. There's loads of cool stuff within Glen uh, Campbelltown, even though there's only three actual distilleries. But within those three distilleries, you have one, two, three, four, five different styles. Yeah, which is outrageous. Um, and yes, it's a. I found a comment the other day which said Campbelltown is the base section of the whiskey orchestra, and that is that rings true in my ears so much like it provides so much kind of oomph and girth and depth to product um especially things like long run spring bank so i would totally recommend checking those out Absolutely. Uh, kevin bryant is going to new york in october any recommendations for a shop or distillery visit king's county uh <laughs> i like the, uh, the type and uh and talk said at the same time <laughs> i actually have a t-shirt that i was going to wear i went to king's county distillery it's in the brooklyn naval yard mm. um you get to wait in this awesome little bar where they have all of their whiskeys behind the bar and they make more, they make an amazing cocktail for you. The distillery tour is about an hour and I had it, uh, it was given to me by a guy called John who was one of the most passionate whiskey tour guides I've ever met. And you get a history of American whiskey from the 1600s. Hey, he's got a little bottle of it. Yeah, uh, I've got a bottle, covered it on all, the channel. This is the uh, bottled in bond. That's very good stuff, that. It's very nice. Um, John will talk you through the history of bourbon from the 1600s to now in about 20 minutes, which you think it'd be rushed, but it's not. You said a little warehouse, you said two little stills. I think it's like $20 for the tour. You get to taste the moonshine, which is actually quite good. Uh, the bourbon, the peated bourbon, and two of their liqueurs, one of which is made from chocolate, which is texturally the weirdest whiskey I've ever tried, uh, and one which is a jalapeno and grapefruit flavored moonshine, mm -hmm. which is, again, quite good and they have an entire cabinet of things i bought their oat whiskey which is beautiful and their cash strength which is 63.6 percent uh also amazing bought a t-shirt while i was there and they also sell bourbon flavored lip balm so if you're not driving take advantage it's three dollars a go i bought four of them for like me and a couple of friends <laughs> um but check out king's county in terms of whiskey shops there's not many um, because it was manhattan they're all quite expensive um but the most interesting one I found was um, Whiskey and Wine off 69 and Oak and Barrel, which is on East 57th Street on 7th Avenue. Mm -hmm. um, don't go there expecting a bargain, but they've got some kind of cool, interesting stuff, which is worth checking out. Um, but yeah, that, that's all I really saw of New York. The rest of it I was quite drunk for, so I don't remember most of it, to be honest with you. Um, buy a Metro card and do not walk. If you think walking through Manhattan is a good idea, don't. It's not dangerous. It's just long. 
I walked from Wall Street to 57th Street. It took me nearly two hours and I had a sunburn at the end of it and was so dehydrated, I felt like I could just like collapse in a Central Park water fountain. Um, get a Metro card, they're $10, use a subway. Google Maps is super helpful. Um, so yeah, do that. But if you're in New York, uh, send me a message just through Whiskey Wednesday. I'll, some amazing bars you should check out. So I'll just send you like a list of bars that are totally worth going to. Excellent. Both beer and whiskey. So yeah. Nice one. Well, uh, that would be a good point to um, wind up then. So just remind everybody who you are. I'm sure they all know, but... Um... I'm sure they do. I've talked for c- continuously for like an hour. So I do apologise if none of you have really seen any of like our content or anything. You can see why it's only like three to five minutes long. I get on a bit of a rant, especially for whiskeys in. But I'm, I'm Phil. I run Whiskey Wednesday. Um, do go and check out the channel. We do some really kind of beautifully shot videos that are very concise, unlike this channel and uh we like to keep things very straightforward and if none of you if any of my subscribers are here um because i did kind of put this thing out on instagram uh do check out vin because you know again he's very to the point he doesn't really pardon the phrase and i do apologize if youtube censors this but there's no kind of there's no bullshit at all with vin it's just like it's to the point you know there's no messing around if he doesn't like it he doesn't like it if he likes it he likes it um which is something a lot of the channels involved with this tend to do and a lot of them are in this uh, comment section at the minute. So do check out all of us. You know, we all like to tell you as, as honest opinion as we can. We won't, we, we're not led by any big companies. We're not owned by any big companies. So we will be as honest with you as possible. Um, but do check us out. We like to just spread love in the community. And um, if you like whiskey, come and join us because it's always a fun ride. Absolutely. Absolutely. Never a true word said. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in. It's been a really fun stream. We've, uh, we've gone Absolutely. Through, that's what happens when the chat's good. Um, it's very good yeah i'm going to read through this as uh, it closes down (laughs) absolutely if you've enjoyed the stream don't forget to uh, give us a little thumbs up it really does help youtube algorithm loves that and uh, of course check out me and phil um he does a review mostly every wednesday um i'm every monday and thursday uh you guys know who who we all are already but yeah thanks everyone for your continued support thanks for phil for joining me today you want to say one final word before we head off uh I'm really hungry, so I'm just going to go to the kitchen <laughs> and start cooking. All right, let's go then. So thanks, everybody. Phil, you stand on the line for a second. We'll have a quick chat after, um, and uh, I'll catch you all on my uh, next reviews. See you See later, later guys. everybody.